The Walking Dead, the ones who live is finally here. I have been looking forward to this show for the longest time. I am one of the only people in my friend group who still watches The Walking Dead, who still loves The Walking Dead. And I'm so happy to see Rick Grimes and Michonne on my screen once again. So this first episode, let's get into it. This is, I have watched this episode three times. The first time on Sunday night, I was just so excited to see everything again that I didn't really pick up on everything. So I had to watch the second time. I was still a little confused. And then the third time was a charm. So I think I have enough information now to talk about it a bit more thoroughly. So it's an FYI, Rick and Michonne independently for many years have been two of my favorite characters on The Walking Dead. And I'm just, I'm so happy that the show is back on. So let's get into it. I should mention before going any further that while I haven't read the comic books and I haven't watched all the spinoffs, I do have a general understanding of what went on in the comics, and I do know a few things that happened in the world beyond, so I will be making reference to those when they come up, and also, of course, I'll be making reference to the main show because, you know, this is a continuation of that, so be warned. Um, spoiler warning. So since the story is told in a non-linear fashion, as Scott Gimple, the showrunner, likes to do, I will talk about the episode based on characters, all right? So we have to start with our boy, Rick. Rick Grimes, finally seeing Rick Grimes after over well, five and a half years it's been now. And I actually watched this scene on the Friday before when it came out. And so just seeing Rick in a room all by himself, kind of staring out the window, looking sad and knowing that he's away from his family and stuff just, you know, made you feel pretty bad. And when he um, put the glass to like his, his carotid artery over there, it was just like, oh man, oh, Rick's, Rick's not doing well because we know him that like, he would only think about doing that um, if things were really, really bad. So obviously they are. And so throughout the story, there's a lot of Rick talking. So I know people have said, oh, it's so much exposition, but I think it actually makes sense because we knew from the finale of the main show that he's been writing Michelle letters for, for years now, right? And also they did show what was going on during those times. So it wasn't just him just spewing information out. We were actually seeing it as well. So the first few minutes we see Rick out on a run at nighttime and a terrible thing happened. So I, there's been a lot of speculation that he was going to lose his arm, just lose his hand um, ever since they released the trailers of this because you never really saw his left arm, his left hand in any of the shots. And I was watching an interview with Dubai and Andrew Lincoln and he made reference to, oh, can we talk about this? So I knew that he was going to lose his hand, um, which is, you know, it's, it's terrible. I, I think he'll be okay because he's Rick and we know people like Aaron have gone handless and have done pretty well, but it was just so terrible to think that he thought the only way he can get away was to cut off his hand so that leash that was attached to it, um, would, he would no longer be tethered to it. But I did think maybe he could have just tried to chop off the actual leash, like the metal rope. I don't know, maybe he tried that before, just too strong, but yeah, cutting off the arm was intense, man, and having to cauterize it in the carcass of a fired zombie, it was, it was pretty gross. So <laughs> it set the tone of how bleak and terrible things were going to go. It was weird seeing Rick in a more subservient role. Not that we haven't seen him like that before, but I guess it makes sense, right? Because there's no way, why would he be away from Alexandria and from his family for seven, eight years or however long it's been? And seeing him in the culling, culling facility, just killing walkers, it's like, he can do so much more than that. And I guess that is what Okafor saw in him because he basically promotes him from the culling facility to work in the CRM and to, into the army. And at first I was just like, I, I was curious, like why did he pick Rick to um, be promoted when you know that he's a wild card? He tried to leave four times. Like, why would you want him in the military where everyone has to follow ranks and follow orders? Like he just doesn't seem like he's that guy. And um, I guess I'll kind of jump into Okafor a little bit here now, too. But when Okafor mentions that he sees something special in Rick and also Pearl, 
and he wants to change the CRM from the inside out. I was like, okay. I was also a little suspicious, right? Because I don't know these people. I don't know what they're up to or what they're trying to get out of him. Um, but yeah, I guess he saw it as an opportunity to get on the inside, get more information, um, you know, be, have access to more information working in the army than just, you know, working in the fields over here. And so he took the role. But the whole promotion to working in the military, I was, my antennas were kind of peaked a little bit too, especially after Rick um, goes for a run and he runs into um, General Beal or the, the main guy, um, Terry O'Quinn's character. And he asked him, you know, what's, what's the purpose of this? And is Okafor up to anything? So the, he asked that for a reason, even though when Rick said no, he said no in unison as to show like, oh, of course, Okafor is okay. No, he knows that something is up and he knows that likely Rick would do something while in the military to either get away or to ruin the system that they've got going on over there. And jumping to Pearl, I don't know. I have, I don't trust Pearl at all. I think she's going to be a major liability going forward because they are both, as Okafor says, they are both um, A's. Oh, speaking of the A and B thing, so it seems as though A and B's are just basically um, like alphas and betas, right? So the A's are leaders and um, the B's are people who follow, right? And so both Pearl and Rick are alphas and typically these alphas are um, executed because I guess they don't want anyone who is like Rick in that alpha sense who would go against the rules and kind of do whatever they want to, but there's something special about these two. But in regards to Pearl, I think seeing as she is resigned to the fact that this is her life now, she's going to be here forever and there's no point in fighting it. And you know, Rick is the complete opposite. I think that um, she could definitely do him in going further. And there are a couple of things that they've established about her character that I thought was pretty telling. For one, we know she likes to drink, right? So we first meet her, she has a big bottle of whiskey. She um, goes to Rick's room and drinks his drink. She tells him, you know, let's go for a drink before we kill each other. And she's always throwing glasses, <laughs> which was kind of funny. It's like, girl, you can't be throwing glasses. We're in an apocalypse. Things are, re resources are limited, but we can tell a lot from her personality and how steadfast she is in the fact that, you know, I can't go out. I can't be with a person I love. So I'm going to be here and rise up to the ranks and do the best that I can within this society. And even the fact that um, on that run, when Rick tried to escape, but then the walker came and then the girl saw him there, the little girl saw him there, and then she, um, you know, she covered up for him and told him like, don't try this again, when he tried to go through the underground pathway there. I just feel as though she's gonna come back to bite him later on. And especially the fact that she told Okafor about him and his family. Um, we know she has loose lips, so I don't have any, there's nothing that makes me think that she won't go to Beale or to Jadis whenever we see her and tell them Rick's business and what he's been up to. Yeah, and with Okafor, at first I was kind of leery about him. Again, this is where the third time watching it came in handy because that time when Rick went to his room and said, like, what do you know about my family and things like that, right? And he was telling the story about how he ended up killing his wife. And I was like, oh my gosh, he killed his wife. But then when I uh, listened to it a bit further from watching it a few more times, so he was part of the military base in Philadelphia. And he went and he bombed out Los Angeles and Atlanta. And he was supposed to bomb out Philadelphia too, because that's what the federal um, armed forces said should happen. And his wife was a Marine. And so she, but she, I was a little confused by that. So she didn't actually want to kill people, follow the orders, but she is, um, you know, in the armed forces. So she does follow the orders. And so he decides to kill her preemptively so that he could save the people in Philadelphia. So he does have integrity. Um, he killed his wife in doing so, but he does have integrity. And again, the only thing I didn't like about him, which I understand, but he was, was very adamant to Rick that, you know, he's not getting out there, he's not going to see Michonne again, 
and if he does try to leave, he'll have to kill him, have to kill her, have to kill Judith, and all these terrible things. And it was just so sad at the end when Rick was writing one of his final letter, letter saying that, you know, he doesn't see Michonne anymore, he doesn't see Judith anymore, he doesn't see the sun, the water, or anything. Like, he's just basically like a shell of a man, like a, like a, just a robot doing things in the society that he knows he can't leave. And it was also weird seeing him like going through like logistics and blueprints and things like that. It's just like such a different world from Alexandria. And one thing I, I, I do appreciate that because with The Walking Dead especially, ever since I went to Alexandria, so season five, the world just kept on getting bigger and bigger, like from going to a suburb to having an alliance with a couple other different places and with the Commonwealth, and like now this which is so huge, and there's a military aspect to it and all that kind of stuff. So it was a lot. So on the helicopter incident, um, I wasn't quite sure what was going on at first, but then I, after I watched it a couple times, I figured out many years had passed since he'd actually been in the military. And so he and Ogrefor are going on um, some kind of mission that they got intel from, and then uh, Okafor, oh my gosh, got shot, and then he just like eviscerated, he imploded from that projectile that was uh, shot to him. It was pretty, it was pretty gross actually. And then they crash, and I'm willing to suspend some disbelief because that, that looked like a horrible helicopter crash, and Rick made it, and he got out of that helicopter, and his friends, they got out, like, they just fell off their bike. <laughs> so, yeah, I can suspend some disbelief there, but, um, yeah, and then... When they are out on the road, out on the field that they landed on, and Rick is fumbling, and I see somebody approaching, um, killing his friends, his comrades. And then towards the end, I could see a katana. And so I said, oh, that's Michonne? And the funny thing is with their meeting is that when she was beating Rick up, she like really got to him. And if Rick hadn't cut off his own arm, she would have sliced it off because that fake arm, that metal arm, but the, the katana made contact with. So she would have sliced off his arm. She kicked him in the face. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Like, she really got to him. And then when she lifted up the um, the mask and they saw each other, it was so shocking because actually I didn't expect them to see each other so quickly, which is kind of nice. I appreciate that. And yeah, I can't wait to see their actual reunion next week, I presume. It'll be very interesting. And so kind of going to Michonne, again, we only really saw her in-universe uh, or in the actual storyline towards the end there. But the flashbacks that Rick had of her, they were so interesting. They were so jarring to see because, like, the, the lighting, the filters were a bit different. They both looked so clean and pre-apocalyptic. It was cool seeing Michonne with braids. And also, I think in the last scene or the last couple of scenes when Rick's talking, he doesn't have a southern accent. He just has a generic American accent, which was interesting. And again, it's a dream, so it's not 100% real or accurate, but it was close. And then all like the snippets, all the flashes towards his um, childhood home and the incident that happened there with his father in the barn and stuff like that. It was very interesting because we, I don't think I've ever heard any reference about his parents or his childhood even. So that was kind of cool. So, yeah, I really, really liked it. Um, a side note, Rick looks really good in all black, actually. I think I thought he looked really nice when he was um, training for the military. And even Pearl, she was wearing this cool tank top, and it had, um, it was black, and it had the three black um, rules for the CRM uh, logo, which I would totally rock that. Like, AMC should make merch and, and sell that tank top. What else can I say? Oh, I did notice on the third watch, I noticed that um, the only cast members are Denai Guerrera, Andrew Lincoln, and Jadis, Pollyanna McIntosh. And so the others appear at the other end of the opening um, title credits. So Okafor and Terry O'Quinn and uh, Pearl Thorne, they're all listed as guest starring, which I don't know if that's just a contract thing or if that means that they're not really going to be in it the entire time. Well, I guess we'll have to see. Um, I am, um, oh gosh, I don't, I'm not looking forward to seeing Jade. It's like, I think Polly Anna McIntosh is a great actress, but um, I don't like the character of Jadis. And kind of a spoiler to World Beyond, Jadis took Gabriel's last name. So she's Jadis Stokes. And they were like barely dating. 
I, she's a weirdo. So, so we'll see how that goes. And yeah, so what did you think about the ones who live? I was, oh, I was still so excited about it. I'm so glad that it's happening. And uh, yeah, I'll be watching it next week and I'll do a video then. So if you want to leave a comment on your thoughts about it, um, go ahead and do that. And I'll see you next week with um, my thoughts on, on episode two. Okay, see you later. Bye. Oh, like, share, and subscribe to I see Melanie. Okay, bye.